In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions asked by listeners uh, like you. Now, the way we open the episode uh, is with a short, typically 35 to 45 minute introductory process where we talk about current events, like what's happening in the world. We talk about current scientific studies, fitness tips. Sometimes we mention our sponsors. And all that jazz. So I'm going to give you the breakdown of what happened in today's Mind Pump episode. So we start out by talking about Adam's brand new look. He did something to his face that is filthy. Just wait till you hear us talk about it. Then we talked about Gold's Gym filing for bankruptcy makes us all very, very sad. We know the gym industry is being hit really hard with the Mm. current uh, you know, pandemic and what's going on. So we feel for you guys. Yep. Then we talked about Thor versus Eddie Hall, the deadlift competition monsters. Those guys are monsters. Battle of Goliaths. And then they're going to fight, apparently, with gloves on. That's kind of crazy. Then I talked about red light therapy's effects on scars, on helping them heal, reducing the appearance of scars, and possibly even stretch marks. Now, there are a lot of red light therapy devices out on the internet. Unfortunately, most of them are not effective. There is a very specific science and type of product that you want to use that is effective, the same ones that are used in studies. Now, the company that we like best is Juve. They make the best devices that we've been exposed to online, and they are one of our sponsors, so we'd have a hookup for you. If you want to get one of the red light uh, products, go to juve.com. That's J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash mind pump. You'll get a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of $500 or more, free shipping. By the way, they finance their red lights as well. So you don't even have to pay all up front and it's 0% APR right now. So you get uh, you don't have to pay any penalties for making payments. Hmm. Then we talked about the show um, called Billions. I haven't seen it, but Adam can't stop talking about it. Then it's we talked awesome, about, Sal. Then we talked about the importance of form and exercise technique and what it does for your body. Then I brought up studies showing the effects of cannabidiol, CBD, and how it improves sleep and how people right now are reporting some of the worst sleep that they have in decades, probably due to the pandemic. Now, our favorite product that contains CBD is Ned. Now, Ned doesn't just have CBD. It's called full-spectrum hemp oil extract. It has lots of other helper cannabinoids that make the CBD far more effective. It's our favorite product that contains CBD on the market By far. Drop a little Ned before you go to bed. Now, they have a a discount for you because you listen to Mind Pump. This is how you get it. Go to HelloNed, that's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash Mind Pump, and you'll get 15% off your first purchase. Then we got into the fitness questions. Here's the first one. This person is training in a 1 to 5 rep range. Then they move to 8 to 12 and eventually 15 to 20. They're phasing the workouts uh, in ways that are effective. But then when they revert back to the 1 to 5, do they use the same weight that they finished in that rep range before? Do they add weight? Do they lower weight? What is the strategy? So we go over that in that part of the episode. The next question, uh, bodybuilders have some pretty intense poses that involve contorting their body in different positions. Are there mobility movements that can help you pose better on stage? So we talked about mobility, but we also talked about how the bodybuilding poses Mm. may actually benefit people who don't even care about competing in bodybuilding. And do you have to do it in bikini briefs? Now, the next question, uh, it says, uh, is it detrimental to squat with your feet angled slightly outward? So there's a little bit of debate in the fitness space. Some people say angling your feet out, perfectly fine. Other people say, keep your feet straight, that's best. We go over the solutions in that part of the episode. And the final question, this person asked us about pornography. No, not if we'd star in pornography. We're done with that part of the business. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's in the past. But really the question was, is it good? Is it bad? Is there a difference between watching porn on your own and Mm. doing it with a person next to you? Yeah, so we talk about something we're not experts in necessarily, but we are experienced in. We talk about pornography in that part of the episode. Also- This month, we have a brand new program that's on sale, MAPS Starter. Now, this is a great at-home workout program. All you need is a stability ball. That's the big physio ball-looking thing that you can sit on, lay on, use to support your body, and dumbbells. That's it, physio ball and dumbbells, and you get a full body workout. There's a few phases in there from stability to building muscle. It's a great program for beginners to teach you good form, but it's also a great program for people who are intermediate to advanced, who need to revisit having good stability, good form, and who have not used 
devices like a physio ball and dumbbells in a while. That novelty can get you to move better, have better mobility and better muscle connection, which of course leads to better gains. So this program, Map Starter, 50% off right now. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsstarter.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.com and use the code STARTER50. That's S-T-A-R-T-E-R-5-0, no space, for the discount. And it's t-shirt time. Ah, shit, Doug. You know it's my favorite time of the week. Wow. Oh, yeah. Well, I never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> we have four t-shirt winners this week. We have for iTunes, Lindsay Foe and RX Ginger. For Facebook, Carly, Nicole, Nicole Ashmore, and Mark J.P. Gonzalez. All of you have won a t-shirt. To get your t-shirt, send the name I just read, include your shirt size and your shipping address, Send that over to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com and we'll get that shirt right out to you. You know when you're playing video games yeah. with your kid and they're real young so they can't play? Yes. Yeah, so you give them the true. controller that's not you connected? You give them the shitty one. No, no, it's, <laughs> not, not, even connected. it's not connected. So he thinks he's playing the whole time. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, that's what we did to just. Oh, man, I'm fighting. I'm fighting. You put it on like the computer mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> That's what we did to I your wasn't mic. doing anything? No. Uh. We, considering you don't listen to the podcast all the time, it would be pretty funny. You could get away with that for sure. I could, we couldn't do that to you because you yeah. listen more often, but Justin, I, I, I'll yeah. let a week go by. We Every now and then, I'll, 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 I'll peer in just to make sure let's you know, be things on, are running let's, the way let's be honest. <laughs> that you're still in there. Yeah, yeah that I'm still part of the part of the deal. Just Let's be honest. Justin is what makes this podcast not annoying. <laughs> if we kept if we kept them off and it was just you and I, mean, I Adam, this is a very very good point. Then we would we yeah. would equally annoy both halves yeah. of the audience. No, there's no doubt yeah. about that. <laughs> be too no annoying. Anyway, I want super device. I was going to ask you uh, what the cost was for the ride. Yeah. For the ride, yeah, the oh, mustache yeah. rides. Definitely. that It looks like you're selling, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. bro. You look like 1983, yeah, Castro, hey, San Francisco uh, chips. <laughs> I, I'm thinking like you know the whole Super Trooper. What yeah, that's dude. who's Super Trooper? What did Doug? What did yeah. Doug call me? That's what he said. 1983, you're San Francisco, Mercury, dude. No, Freddie Mercury. Yeah, that's what yeah. Doug said. Oh my god, yeah, yeah, it is. Queen. But I will yeah. say this, okay? Whether you we like, we are the champions. It's good, my friend. Right? If, if forget whether it looks good or not, or how funny, any of that stuff. Yeah. If we were just judging your mustache based off of Fullness. mustache context, the credentials, like there right. was a list of things that made must like to rank them. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. pretty good, dude. It's pretty solid, right? It's straight. It's full. Yeah. It goes to the sides nicely. You're working on it. Yeah. I don't know, yeah. man. Yeah. I feel like you got some good mustache <laughs> genetics. No. I know. It, it took, <laughs> I think it took till I was like 30 before I could grow a good one. No, it didn't. Yeah, it was pretty. Well, maybe not. Maybe not 30 for a mustache. But <laughs> it's like you look younger but creepier all at the same time. Do you, <laughs> equally I creepier. I don't know how younger. that happened. Well, you, you know, quarantine time right now, so I'm trying to spice things up with Katrina and I's relationship. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, <laughs> did it work? For, yeah, yeah. Cops and robbers this that's weekend. A that's a good call. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You got the mirror glasses. Yeah. Or she what? got caught. Yeah. Let's just. My hair's grown back <laughs> since yeah, I yeah. shaved it, and I'm realizing like how bad my little skunk is. In the front so i had an experiment where i took a sharpie like a gray sharpie and it worked what yeah i fucking colored it wait no, a minute didn't. wait a minute did. you, you colored him gray yeah well because i have a white streak you know uh, like like a straight up skunk patch so you sharpied your hair sharpied wow fucking works that's uh, <laughs> that's a little, little hack out there for you guys that's you know, it, yeah, it, a little yeah. hack did yeah, you get hack. that did you get that out of the duct tape Duct tape fixes everything book or it what? It is. <laughs> that's a truth. So, Adam, I want to ask you one more question about your mustache before we move on. Yeah. <laughs> In the past, you've said you've grown a beard yeah. to hide the chubbiness around the face and chin. Yeah. But now you've shaved the beard part that covers that and yeah. only left the part that doesn't cover it. Yeah, yes, yeah, so my right. face looks fat right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I see that. I like, it's like you're emphasizing that. Uh, no. uh, that that's, I think that was part of the motivation. I was like, you know what? I, I need to see that fat face in the mirror every day. It's going to keep, no, me, from, keep me from eating. No, <laughs> so, no, so, so, yeah. I need to stop eating. I need to stop eating treat. I, you know, I did the first. I hope I've, your bed rotates. I've never done this before. Okay. Uh, the fir a first time guilty pressure. I'm, I'm blaming it on quarantine. Okay. I ordered dessert via delivery by itself yeah. dessert yes they, uh, not even other food the ice cream cookie <laughs> that ice cream cookie store place yeah. delivers on on fucking DoorDash wow and this weekend we were you know it was a movie night and i'm just like you know what I, we haven't had a treat or dessert we never when we go grocery shopping we never buy this stuff for us i'm like i'm craving ice cream you know i've been doing the magic spoon every night for like forever i'm like i haven't had it and you know what it was it was all the talk last week about that that made me go you know what I deserve some ice cream right now. Yeah. I wonder if I deserve some, no, I have some me time. <laughs> I wonder, okay, if if there's anybody delivering 
ice cream. Yeah. Sure as shit, they're delivering ice cream. So I did, for the first time ever, I did, did dessert delivered to my house. Wow. wow. Now, what is that's, that? What that's is decadence. What does that look like? What did you get? The, it was from this company, and I feel bad that I, I can't give them a shout out because I don't remember the name of the company. And they're uh, not paying us. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're not paying us. Yeah, so like, therefore, so, you get nothing. Beep, it bleeds out. Uh, it's no, like a cookie sandwich. So I got one of those cookies, like a chocolate chip, big, massive chocolate chip, like homemade type of cookie, two of them, you know, with the ice cream in the middle. Uh, wow. That's yeah. like Baked Bear. Uh, Have you ever had Baked Bear? No. Oh, yeah, you, you build your own, like, cookie sandwich with ice cream in the middle and sprinkles and shit? Yeah, that's what this is. Mm. So I, I could put I put uh, mint chip ice cream in the middle of a chocolate chip cookie, and it was it was yeah. worth it. Look dude. at the two fat kids commiserating here, Justin, <laughs> like, Doug. I'm like, you just, spark, on, Doug? you just sparked something inside <laughs> me. Well, and, and, that, and that is what sparked the, I need to see this fat face. I, <laughs> I was, I was shaving I myself. <laughs> Hey, myself. Hey, I better but, recognize what I'm working yeah, with right yeah, now. Hey, if it doesn't, if it doesn't yeah. work, what's the next level? You're going to have like half shirts? Yeah. Just have your belly? In. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. You know what's funny? It reminds me of a story uh, <clears throat> that Arnold used to tell in his uh, encyclopedia of bodybuilding. He had, when he first became a bodybuilder, he was like a phenom winning competitions, even at a young age, but he had such small, skinny calves mm -hmm. that what he did, and this is apparently a true story, is he cut off all of his sweats at the knee. So every time he went to the gym, so had to see it. he was reminded that his calves were tiny. And then he actually eventually became known for having incredible calves. He went from having skinny calves to having incredible oh, wow. calves. It actually worked for because him. Apparently it did. Yeah. I do stuff like that. You guys don't do that? I mess with myself like that. What? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like, a, that's par It's partially true. Like I know yeah. I know that the part of what I, I, I like about the contouring beard is that it makes my face look leaner. Mm. And I know that I have to get pretty damn lean to get like a, a chiseled jawline. Yeah. And so I've got the fat <laughs> face thing going on right now, and that's yeah. part of like, if I got to look at it every sense. day, it's I'm more likely to make better choices. <laughs> it you makes know sense to me. I have my kids pinch my, my stomach rolls. So, Do they really? Yeah. Uh, yeah see, it's, I, it's fun. See, I have the opposite problem from you because if, if I, I grow a beard to hide my gaunt <laughs> face because I store nothing in my face. Yeah. So what ends up happening is as I age, yeah. my face just gets less and less like yeah, you filled need a out. little bush to help. Yeah, so I start to look old. How many DMs have you? Because uh, no BS six pack abs has been flying off the shelves right now, right? So yeah. crazy. How, how many DMs are you getting right now about what you look like in that? Yeah, I've already got them abs. I've gotten Sal. about five so far. So the so I shot and I created the no BS six pack formula with Maps Anabolic back in I want to say 2012. We filmed the program in like. 13 or 14, right, Doug? 2014? 2013 for Anabolic. I think 2014 for No BS. So we filmed it. This is 2014, and I was going to be on video, so I dyed my hair. So, no, my hair didn't just go from black to completely gray Should in six sharpen years. it, bro. No, I didn't sharpen yeah. it. Didn't sharpen it. <laughs> totally works. Uh, I was, like, lean for the for it, and it's all shot in my old personal training studio. So if you want to see what my old studio looks like, mm. and you want to see You want to know what I was- What I want to see is what uh, Adam's famous pose where he bites his shirt and is like- Nyarrr. Oh, my God. I'm yeah. so embarrassed I did that once. <laughs> I got to go back on my Instagram and delete that. No, I've seen there. a lot of people do that now. I remember when you're all shredded, and then, like, <laughs> oh, all these guys no. bit that, like, pose off you oh. yeah, I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah sexy yeah like abs and biting you know what though i yes. i tell you what uh you were already pretty damn good on camera mm. for somebody who has no experience mm. doing that and watch and i haven't watched those in those videos in forever yeah and I'm watching. I'm like, you know what? You you were pretty dang good right out the gates, dude. It's weird because uh, I'm I love I, that camera. I, well, you know what? <laughs> That's what when Doug like. first put mm. it on, it felt there's a few things that you know when you do something. It feels like, oh, I'm, this is good. I feel I feel good at it. Yeah. And uh, when I first became a trainer, I felt that. When I was managing gyms, I felt that. And then when I got on camera for the first, that doesn't mean I was great. It just meant I felt comfortable early on. That's all. So, yeah. No, you said the confidence. Because I have to say that that's an area that I didn't anticipate. Uh, when we first started all this, that I wouldn't like or that would be hard. Right? Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That's because you like being yeah, in front totally. of, you like doing it in front of people. That's why I thought it, would, it was weird for me. I thought it, it's nothing, a weird interaction. Well, I just thought nothing could be more nerve wracking for people to get up on stage and talk to hundreds potentially of people. And if I have overcame that, mm -hmm. then when just talking to a camera, me and Doug, it should be no problem, but it's really awkward. It's for totally me. different. Yeah, it's, yeah, it is different. Yeah, because I feel less comfortable in front of people. I feel more comfortable in front of a camera. But let me, okay, so do you think it's because you know you're in front of a camera, you know it's going to be recording you, and we'll see it afterwards, or is it that there's no feedback? So this is, yeah, this is my, 
what I think for myself personally is when I'm on camera, uh, I tend to, to talk faster and ramble. Mm. And when I'm in person, I, I, I slow it down because I can see, like you said, I can see your reaction. Oh, so if yeah. I, if I'm Just going back, yeah, if I'm going a certain direction and I see people like, you know, like well, trying to, they're looking kind of sideways at me because maybe I'm talking too fast or maybe I'm not, I'm not making my point clear. I can, I can read all the, the mm -hmm. feedback that I'm getting from the crowd and then I could change what I'm saying or I can elaborate on something that maybe they didn't understand or whatever. I, that so I I like that I like that feedback yeah. of knowing if I have your so what's attention the trick because I'm looking out in the audience picturing everybody naked but from mm. in front of the camera I'm like do you picture like robots naked what do you do Doug you just picture him naked Doug yeah because he's okay. the one holding yeah, he's the camera the one holding it. no you know what so when I'm talking to a crowd although if, if I get into it I feel comfortable too but initially it's because I'm aware of all the people in the room who are looking at me and that if I allow it can start to mess with me a little bit. But if I'm in front of a camera, I don't feel like anybody's watching me. I feel like I'm putting on a show and it's just me and my buddy in the room. And if I'm in, oh, so here's the other thing. You know what helps me a lot? I don't know if this, this will help you, but this helps me. If I have family or friends in the room when I'm pre presenting, I feel more confident because I want to show them like uh, what I'm doing. So I feel like I turn it up even no, more. No, that 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 that's horrible for me. Really? Yeah, I'm like, get out of here, go away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, they they screw me up every yeah. time we've had like anybody I know that's in the audience. I'm like, you gotta go. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'm not gonna be myself. You know what hurts me that I would love to? I, I try to watch you, Justin. Is mm. I can't be funny in front of people or a camera. Then it feels too much like I'm acting. It just doesn't uh, work. No, that that's the only thing that comes like, okay, easy for me. It's like trying to be serious and present like real information is, I just like, I get way too inside my head. God, if we could just, yeah. if we could all just make we gotta a combine, dude. We need to make a baby. We got a Voltron it, uh, you know, human centipede, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, you got all yeah. the perfect stuff. And, oh, disgusting. <laughs> Whoa. So gross. Sorry, I was just too, waiting for you guys to react. Too far. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Disgusting. Anyway, dude, do you guys hear uh, the news about Gold's Gym? No. no. They apparently are going to be applying for Chapter 11. What? Yeah. Oh. So they no, wait, wait, no, like, like the entire franchise because, yeah, because it is a franchise. Explain how that's going well, to work. I can pull up the study. Let me see if I can find not the study, the article. I'll Google it. Let me see. Um, but yeah, apparently they're chapter 11. I would assume if they're applying for chapter 11, it's the franchise. So that's what I would assume because it made big news. Why would the news, you know, why would like ABC report it? Yeah. How does that now that's interesting to me. How does that work? Okay. Imagine right here. The, okay. USA Today. Gold's gym files for chapter 11 bankruptcy protection amid COVID closings. So this is apparently, they're permanently closing. Oh yeah, no, it's the, it's the actual company, Gold's, wow. not the franchise, not the crazy. franchisees. It's saying that um, the, the mostly franchise Gold Gym, which recently permanently closed 30 company owned locations. So they had their own locations mm -hmm. that they shut down 30 permanently. They said that the bankruptcy will have no further impact on current, you know, operations. Of course, they're going to say that. So, 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 what happens? So, let, let's pretend for a second you own Gold. Uh -huh. Okay, you and then I, but I own five franchises. Yeah. So I own five. I, I own five of the Gold's brand. What happens when you file for bankruptcy? What happens to me? Do I have to change my logo? Am no, I, I think what it means is because when you have a franchise, because they, because the, I pay fan, franchise fees to you, you're still yeah. going to pay them. But I think what it means is that because the company itself provides certain services and things for that, yeah, including advertising. So I think that they're they're they aren't making money. They're not be able to cover, and it might be because you have so many Gold's Gym franchisees not being able to pay yeah. right. their dues or whatever. Right, right. So now they're totally screwed. I mean, the company itself owns sixty three. Locations. Well, so, what does that mean for the down. Venice, the you know the the Mecca one? I don't think Venice is owned by Golds. I think that one might be a franchise, okay, from someone else. Yeah. But this is, I mean, Twenty Four Fitness talked about it. Now Golds, you know, those are two very powerful brands. Oh yeah. So it's kind of I don't know, man. It's a little bit well. Uh, I had scary. You, you know we did that episode right that's been going around, and I had a lot of people reach out to me, and there's some some states are already you know opening back up. Yeah. Gyms. And the consensus that I, I'm seeing is that people who have the opportunity to still go to the gym are still not. They're wanting to kind of wait and just like what we predicted it. There's yeah. there's only a handful. And you saw they're making them wear masks and it's crazy. That's like, the regulators. That? That's all the regulators. The, all the regulations are going to make it impossible to conduct your model. So you have to completely change your model, which is very. It's expensive. not just that. It's also that okay. 
there, there's already been lots of people that are speculating that we're going to have see a spike back up, right? Sure. It's kind of inevitable, right? If we, yeah. if we, if we slowed everything down, oh, man. and then we open everything up, there's probably going to be a spike. That has to happen. Yeah, so there's, a, so there's a lot of people I think that are just like, I think I'll wait mm -hmm. until I see everyone that everything yeah. being open, and I think we're going to see that, you know. Obviously, we talk about uh, our our little bubble, the fitness space, but I think that's what we're going to see everywhere, like movie theaters, everything. I think when it all goes, and even when the the regulations come out that oh, you have to wear a mask or six feet apart, and we and we abide by all that, I still think there's going to be a, a a large percentage of the population that are going to be hesitant to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That they're going to be like, I'll just wait. I mean, I've already I've already locked myself up for two months. Mm -hmm. Sure, now I can go out, but I'm gonna probably choose not to do some of these things that are, you know, put us up in a, in, in a bunch of a gr groups of people under a, a roof, you know? Yeah, I think that consumer behaviors are going to be, a, are definitely going to be changed for a while. I don't know if it'll be permanent, but it's going to be a while because there's, like you said, Adam, there's a lot of fear. So anything that people think that there's going to be a crowd or lots of people or touching things that other people are touching, which gyms are, I mean, all of the above, yeah. it's definitely going to be, uh, it's definitely going to be effective. So but, you, I, but I have been, I'll tell you what, along those lines, sorry to interrupt, Denmark uh, has been reopening and so far they've shown that there aren't crazy spikes with infection rates for them. So that's good news, but still early because mm -hmm. it's, it's totally, it, it's more likely you'll see a spike when more and more people are out. That's the more likely thing. So that's good. And I'll tell you what, dude. <laughs> I'm reading st article after article, and I don't want to name these gyms or businesses because I don't want them to to I don't want to call them out. But a lot of businesses are opening anyway because they have to. They yeah. can't. They, they in their eyes they have to. So there's gyms that are saying. I've heard you. rumors of that too. Yeah, oh. they're just opening like under wraps, and like people are coming in. Well, yeah. What, well, what do you do? You kind of force an owner's hand at that point, right? Yeah. Like it's either, you have to. It's either you feed your family. You either risk you risk yeah. being you know, getting in trouble in a fine, and you and you operate, or you risk staying closed longer and then going bankrupt. But, well, I mean, look, it's a hard position to be in. You, you guys are all. You, you got to do it eventually. You guys have families. If you're in a situation where you are screwed. And you're like, either I risk getting caught or I am totally screwed yeah. and we lose our house or I can't pay the bills or I can't get my kids, I can't feed my kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what decision are you going to make? I think most people are going to take the risk yeah. because you're between a rock and a harder place. So what are you going to do? Yeah. So you're mm -hmm. starting to see that. And there were protests in California. Did you guys see that? I did. Sacramento and I LA. Did. Also, did you see Gavin Newsom was trying to open, like he was trying to make it so like everybody would go back to school during the summer just in case then, you know, it came back in, in the fall like they're trying to predict, like there might be a resurgence of it. Oh, trying to get schools to start early then? Or? <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, they snubbed that idea and yeah, we're like, luck. no, we're opening in, you know, mid-August or whatever, like normal. So good luck thank with God. that. Are, aren't there some countries that school pretty much goes year round? Well, uh, oh, I know what you mean. Um, I think so. Well, Sweden never shut down school. Sweden, yeah. Sweden had them all open. Did they? Yeah, they they, they did much more lax uh, measures. Um, now, to be fair, they have more infections and deaths than uh, their neighbors. But they're talking about how they're getting closer and closer to herd immunity. Because now the argument is, yes, we might we might have a higher spike, but then we're out of it faster. And by yeah. you flattening the curve, you're going to have the same you know amount of problems because it just lengthens it. That's the debate right now. Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. Did you guys see? Uh, so I guess I just saw it on social media just recently. Uh, you know, Thor the mountain uh, versus uh, Eddie Hall. Like the so they've had this this ongoing sort of rivalry between the two of them in terms of like winning world strongest and all that kind of stuff, or like the Arnold. And uh, I guess so. So Thor obviously is reigning champion now, but uh, uh, this company paid them to box. So now they're, they're doing what? celebrity boxing. No, yeah. I did not know. I remember we predicted this. We talked about oh this back God. when. You did, yeah. Yeah, remember when we Core Sports, I think. Is I, the and I said this to you that uh, don't be surprised. I mean, these guys, because of the, if they the each, following. Yes, if they yeah. each have millions of people following. And even, those are huge human beings, dude. Those are just like giants. How like, mad, though, are you? How mad are you? It's going to look ugly. How mad are you, though, if you're like a, a real boxer? A real boxer who's been boxing for 20 years of his life just made. It to the professional level, or maybe you've even been a pro for a while, but you're kind of unknown and you've been right. trying to fight your way up, and you make hardly you've been sharpening any, your skill every day, hardly to, anything. Yeah. And then these two guys who don't even box at all, and it's just gonna be a sloppy slugfest. Can what, do a pay per view that will outsell that's, anything. That's Justin, that's exactly why I think it won't last because when you watch people who don't know how to fight 
fight after a while you're like eh, I see I don't I don't agree with that <sighs> yeah. I, it doesn't matter bro what do you it's think it's entertaining what do you think Thor and Eddie Hall are gonna look like in a boxing match terrible a, <laughs> they're gonna be so deconditioned if, <laughs> if someone doesn't kill the other person in the first like 30 seconds the oh, rest yeah. of the match is gonna be them that, hugging. that's gonna determine everything because uh -huh. they're, yeah, the, they're gonna give it a full throttle yeah but think of yourself as a, the young teenage boy who's interested or a fan of either one of those it's like a, you know that's a debate you're yeah. having with your buddies like yeah. no I bet you Eddie yeah. would whoop his ass yeah. no and then it's sure, like you beat me in deadlifting but I fucking punched you know what I would face. like to see? I'd like to see one of those guys box a like high level amateur boxer who's a heavyweight. Just hey, Thor versus so and so who's a you know pretty good level amateur boxer. Let's see how well he does. You know that's what I'd like. Well, to see. then that would look like. Remember what? Uh, remember when Kimbo Slice first hit the scene? Yeah, oh, yeah. And he was uh, he had all the street fights and he was whooping everybody's ass. Kimbo and, knows how to box though. Yeah, but versus, he, he still got his ass kicked the first time he fought a UFC guy. Of course, the oh, first yeah. time he fought a UFC guy, the guy just whooped him. But he still has like skills way over you know what, right, right the average person. Who but my box my him. point is though is like there's of course he's gonna, they're gonna get whooped if you, someone like. Kimbo Slice still got his ass kicked. You know those guys would get whooped by Do, a robot. You know what that reminds me of? The original Pride uh, Fighting Championship in Japan, which, by the way, because there's no there's no MMA going on right now, uh, yeah. they're starting to show and air like old fights from Pride and UFC. So I was watching like the old ones from the UFC. What's that guy's name? Bob? Uh, oh, Bob Sapp. Uh, Sapp. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> He monster. was a fucking huge human being. Huge. So, so Pride- like King Kong, everybody. Pride used to do that. They would put- uh, like a giant against a small guy who was skilled, and let's just see, <laughs> let's just see what happens. Yeah. And those fights were. There was one fight where Bob Sapp, so he's this massive human being, and he fought this little Japanese dude who was a wrestler, and he outweighed the guy by I don't know eighty pounds, hundred pounds, maybe more, maybe more than that, probably hundred fifty pounds. The dude went in to take him down. Sap just laid down, flattened him, <laughs> stood up, and power bombed him for oh, real. No, dude. Yeah, and I was like, "Did he just kill know, this person? Like he literally could kill somebody with yeah. his weight." Luckily, so but, did but, you, but what did Thor do? He deadlifted he, like five hundred one, right? He, no, five hundred two. Five hundred two. One uh, kilograms. Was, oh, yeah. it was five hundred one. That was yeah. five hundred two. Yeah, I saw that. He thousand something broke, pounds broke the record. Yep. Now this is a strongman record because he used wrist straps. I saw. Yes. Okay. 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 How? What an insane... I hey, bro, it, it, it came up smooth as butter, oh. too. It didn't look like he grinded it at he all. He got so big, dude. Have you seen like pictures of his progression of getting big? Have you seen him He's next... so big. Did you see... Uh, Stan Efferding posted a picture. You know how big Stan is, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Stan yeah. is a fucking rhino, Yeah, he looks right? like he could put him in his pocket. Yes. He's a beast. He's what, 6'9"? Yeah, he's a beast. It's just a whole yeah, different six, nine, like species of uh, human almost. I Doesn't know. even make sense. It's yeah, insane. It anyway, crazy. crazy stuff. So uh, got some cool um, studies to talk to you guys about in regards to red light therapy. So, you know, obviously Jessica's pregnant. And so one of the things that we talk about or, you know, we're looking into is stretch marks and stuff like that. So I did some research on mm. how red light therapy affects uh, wound healing scar, uh, like reducing the appearance of scars and uh, stretch marks. And believe it or not, there are studies, there's actually quite a few, that show that it helps. It helps with those things. So there was a study yeah. on, they did one with kids. So there were 15 children and they treated half of them with for, for their scars for three months and compared the differences to the untreated areas. They determined that the scars treated with red light therapy showed significantly reduced scarification and appearance. And then they concluded that red light treatments are safe and effective for raised scars. So if you have scars that are a little raised, mm -hmm. it can help lower them. Then in, in 2004, there was a study of burn scars that found that patients treated with red light on average showed twice the de decrease in visible scarring as those who didn't use uh, red light therapy. Well, I, I imagine this Crazy. is the same science that supports why it's so good for my psoriasis, right? Because obviously it's not doing something in my gut that's healing my, my autoimmune issues, no. right? It's doing something that's with the skin that makes it look so much better. And I get DMs all the time about that because I've brought it up on the show and no, it, it makes a big difference. Uh, you have to be consistent, though. Yes. Yeah. You yes. Know, and that, and that's it's not like you use it once. There needs no. to be like a de designated red room in your house. Uh, that's like, what I, I'm I have. Trying that. to create that, yeah, with that. like a closet. So yeah. we've created that in our in our one of our guest rooms, and I just I I bring Max in there. So wait till you read that. So I I started doing research on the putting him in front of it. You know, especially when you when you first have a baby, you're not taking him outside. You're not you're not you're keeping him inside before he gets all his shots yeah. and everything like that. And so we keep him. And depending on what time of the year it is, you're you're probably going to be indoors during those early years. So I, I mean, I remember asking the doctor. I'm like, listen, I've seen they they put some preemie babies on those 
you know, yeah, the, like UV beds. Or yeah, the UV and, beds, yeah. things like and that. Billy so blankets. Yes, for exactly. So I thought, you know, is it okay for him to be in front of the red light? He's like, yeah, no, absolutely. So when I get in front of it, I just I play with him. That's kind of our routine. Is I'll go in the room and and just I'll let it the whole room, and then him and I mm. play in there for like fifteen. Well, 20 it minutes. sounds it's. I mean, it almost sounds silly because you read the list of things that red light therapy is supposed to help with, mm -hmm. and it sounds like a bunch of you know no pun intended red flags for bullshit. It says helps regrow hair. Uh, anytime something says that, I'm like whatever. Yeah. Helps with wrinkles. Okay, like that's about you know helps with stretch marks. Help with your skin. But the funny thing is, if you look it up, and I challenge people to do this, it's look up the studies. I'm not talking about one study or two studies. There's like a couple decades of studies that actually show mm -hmm. that it does help with those kinds of things. So it's pretty crazy. I, I think the thing that you have to be careful of is there's a lot of people that, uh, because there's so much great studies supporting that, you know, the average consumer, uh, I, even even me, like I can't look at a, a, a juve light and then like a, some generic one and, and know visually what oh, the difference yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. So it's really easy for people to get scammed on that. Like, oh, I, you know, I heard Mind Pump talk about red light. Oh, I'm fine. People Let are me, just painting the well, light yeah, bulbs. Exactly. Let me get on Amazon and just look for the cheapest red light that I can get and I'll start using it. And then they just buy some generic red light. And that's not where <laughs> those, that ain't going to do nothing. No, the actual, if you get the same, they're expensive. If you get the same power and frequency, and dose and all the stuff that are used in, stu in, in actual studies, you're going to pay money. It's not inexpensive. It's yeah. not a cheap product. So if you find a red light that is inexpensive, then it's probably not the actual, like the one that, the, the kind that they use in studies. There's a particular frequency and dose. And like you said, Adam, consistency makes it work. If oh, you yeah. use it, you know, w once in a while, you're not going to see it, but you have to use it every single day or every other day to see, you know, you know those types of benefits. No, benefits. No, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Uh, thanks, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, there you go. You know, you guys know what's going on right now. I'm so excited for is uh, Billions is back on TV, dude. That's such a Mm, good show. Oh, I know. Sunday I was the premiere. You still haven't seen it? No, I haven't watched it at all. Oh, whatever. Why? Yeah, well, let's have a conversation. Well, I was yeah, trying yeah, to watch yeah. it. I, I tried to watch the- what was, Wait, wait. You know what you're watching? What was that damn show that he- You know that, by the way, it broke all kinds of records, the show that you talked Extraction? about. Extraction? Yes. I told you guys. <laughs> Extraction did? I still haven't seen it. That's I'm, all the teenage kids- I'll, I'll give that one a fair go, I'm Sal, selling it appropriately. It, yeah. Okay, Plot, uh, it's not like a great story. Right, no, right. That's a, if it's like a John Wick kind of deal, if I'm you, in. If you want like good, what I mean by good action is the fight scenes look like they're cool, they're different, they're legit. Yeah. The car yeah. scenes are some of the best car scenes I've ever seen in movies. They're fun yeah. and exciting yeah. like that. I'll be watching that by myself. Then you watch yeah. that. But yeah. no, I haven't seen Billions. Yeah, no, Billions amazing, dude. Oh, it's such good, like thick, like plot, like so many different things going on that uh, it, it just gets, I love that this season is still compelling so far. Like yes. it, it's like the the story of, of all of them, you know, and their interactions. This is like, it's like a three, three way kind of like fight for power. And, and dude, Taylor's getting fucked the most out of this. Well, I just, I just think it's interesting i'm trying i was trying to well last night we watched it and i'm like man i love this show i was talking to katrina and i was trying to like think of have have they ever done a show that really lets you peer into like a billionaire's life mm. like how they, how they make their money how they operate the way their brain and they, they do such a good job of is it the, realistic oh yeah really it, it yeah. seems like it yeah 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 this i mean of course with the television shows there's i'm sure they exaggerate a lot of situations but i think they probably try and stay very well, very true to the type of it's almost like think about what you do if like money really isn't like a limiting factor you know like if i want to get somebody to spy or do things or like find loopholes or whatever in whatever thing i'm trying to to get towards like uh you know get, get bend the rules and all that you have people that you can hire for that at that level yeah you know yeah. what's what sucks about that what's crazy about that when you're a billionaire you have people coming to you, like politicians and lawmakers, saying, "Hey, yeah, you know, hey, can we hang out? Like, what's the deal? You know, can you help me out?" And that's why it's cool because I think they do a good job of like tying in the political side of it yeah. and like all the corruptness that probably happens at that level. And you can't help but go, "Like, God, you got to think that this is happening." Yeah, on a I, I think I, I think I'm gonna I think I'll I'll pick up on. I, I, but I did try to watch Black as fuck. I did watch the first uh, like half of the first or or three quarters of the first. Episode. It does look good. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. funny. Yeah, it does it's look funny. really Did good. Did you ever get into the office? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah so not super into it, but I've seen episodes. Oh, okay. So I love The Office. You watch The Office. Yeah, I love The Office. Yeah, and it's got, it's got three different characters from The Office in mm-hmm. it, and it's written with that style. So it's I mean, if you like yeah. The Office, I think you'll enjoy okay. that. Dude, yeah. so I was working out this morning, um, and often I get these thoughts and ideas around exercise, obviously when I'm working out. And I was thinking about you know all the the most important things to focus on when you're working out for you know just good results, right? And at the top of the list is always for me form. Anytime, I mean, this is what a trainer is good for: is teaching form, making sure you have good technique. Obviously, because form either makes an exercise effective or it makes an exercise ineffective or worse, makes it uh, so that you can hurt yourself. But at the very least. You can go from this is a great exercise to this ain't ain't doing anything for you. So I was thinking of all the different ways that you know as trainers we help people with their form techniques we can use besides watching people correcting the form helping them connect. There's a, you know a few different things that you can do, and one of them is changing the the just the the position that the person's in with the exercise, so it forces them to have good form. So an example would be. Uh, a Z press, right? If you're doing an overhead press standing, your the tendency to cheat or the the you know the, just just moving the bar in a way that's not, it's not supposed to happen. The tendency is much higher. The the risk for that's much higher because you're standing. You can pop up on your feet. You can arch back. You leverage. You leverage, right? It's it's just it's too uh, alluring. It's too much of a, a risk for some people. But having them sit on the floor, legs out, like if you cheat, you can't do the exercise. So another tool that I, you know, and I, we brought this up on a previous episode, but I want to bring it up again, um, is the physio ball. Physio ball forces you to have good form, which is what makes it valuable uh, for people. It's what, what makes it a valuable tool. So uh-huh. it's funny you bring this up because uh, this weekend I, I was training with uh, the stability ball or physio ball, whichever one you want to call it. Uh, it, what, what I've noticed I catch myself doing, this is for our audience. I get a lot of DMs around this, so this is for you guys that ask this question a lot. Of like, what program are you following right now, or what are, what are you what are you training like? And what I tend to have this tendency now, I do have moments where like when I powerlift came out, that was such a new program for us. I never followed a pro a, a powerlifting protocol, so that one I actually followed to a T. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, most all of the programs that we write, I mean, it's a it's a a collection of our experience between the three of us. We've trained that way ourselves, our clients for a very long time. So following it to a T all the way through. Sometimes I'm, eh, it's not really my thing. But what I notice that I do always is whenever we have a program that we're talking about or we're selling for the month because it's half off or whatever, I always end up implementing some of the fundamentals or f- some of the philosophy oh, yeah. from that. So like last month in Anywhere, I was doing bodyweight stuff and I would pick, you know, I would pick and choose certain mm-hmm. things that I want to implement because it rem- we're talking about it. So it reminds yeah, me. Yeah, it becomes top of mind again. Yeah, exactly. It's top yeah. of mind. And I go, wow, you know what? It's been a long time since I've actually pulled the stability ball yeah. and trained on it. And there is a lot of great benefits from it. And so I catch myself. I'm glad doing you that. guys are exercising with it because when I had the stability ball out again, I'm like, oh, we're using this tonight, honey. <laughs> Hundred percent. I highly suggest no, you another did. great tool. Oh my god, uh, for the bedroom. Yeah. Hey, can you lay here for a second? I'm serious. That's, that's, that's hilarious. I've told many yeah. married people about this. Oh gosh. Yes. Uh, anyway, so uh, by the way, you know they make stability balls with sex toys on them. I just reminded me. I, I, I yeah. Don't I you remember my sister was working ago. for it? Did, don't you what, remember she had a for that ball? one? Yeah, you don't really? remember. You don't remember her. I mean, I remember that. You company, said she worked but... for a dildo company, but you didn't say exactly what they. Well, they do everything. It's just like a sex toy company, so they wow. do everything, and one of them is like a stability ball with a fucking dildo on it. Wow, yeah, that's yeah. advanced. You don't well, remember I mean, her sending that to us it like keeps a couple the years ago? Client secure. Sometimes they slide off the. Oh know, my so god! Just yeah. kidding. That's oh terrible. Gosh. So, uh, so listen. So the other uh, what, two days ago, I uh, was talking to my sister's fiance. Great, great dude. Love him to death. He's a police officer. And we were having conversations around like, what is, because I, 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 I'm i curious, what does crime look like right now? People are not going out. Mm-hmm. We're in California. It's we still, low. Right? Everybody's got masks on, so what? who knows what's going on? Well, so that's what I thought. I thought crime would be low. And he says, it's, it's not lower, it's different. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, we don't get as many like, you know, robberies or gang violence and stuff like that. He goes, but we get a, we're getting way more domestic violence and oh, yeah, stuff yeah. like that at the home, yeah, which, shit. oh, that's terrible. He said it's getting, yeah. he said that went up through the roof or because people, I think they're home, they're stressed out. Yeah. So that led me down a path money. of, of reading what people are suffering more from because of the, the situation and insomnia and sleep issues has 
something like doubled or something like that. Like insane, insane explosion. In that makes sense. Yeah. In sleep issues. And How was, weird is that, though, that we have more time on our hands and then yeah, you have insomnia? Technically, you can sleep in, right? Well, well, there's two reasons that the article said. One is the changing of their people sleep rhythms. So, okay, I don't have to. Yeah. Before, I had to wake up at 6 a.m. to get ready to drive to work, whatever. Now, I don't have to be on Zoom until 9. So, I'm just going to go to bed late, wake up at, you know, 8.00. 45 right. hop on zoom mm -hmm. the other one they think has to do with and this one i agree with is just more stress and anxiety that's keeping people because that's the number one reason uh. so i was doing more reading on what can help this besides stress management and you know all the hard stuff like is there you know what are the best remedies and the ones i came up with are uh chamomile tea passion flower both natural herbs that can help with anxiety and then CBD and cannabinoids, just mm -hmm. they do the absolute. I, I pulled up a couple studies. In fact, I'll pull them up right now for you guys. This is a study published in 2019 called Can Cannabidiol and Anxiety and Sleep, a large case ser uh, series. And they found this was a pool of 72 adults, and they found that sleep scores improved within the first month of use in 66.7% of the patients. Now, 66.7% improvement in sleep is huge yeah. with anything that's not a pharmaceutical because anytime you have somebody try something that's right. natural for sleep, it, like sleep is such a hard thing to, tr to treat. Mm -hmm. Another study conducted by Project CBD examined 1,500, over 1,500 people who use CBD issues for uh, sleep issues and staying asleep. And it found that CBD reduced the average time it took those individuals to fall asleep from 62 minutes to 20 minutes. So it cut it down by mm. two thirds the time it took them to sleep. And then they also said that users reported waking up less throughout the night from four times on average to just once. So it's a huge difference. Huge difference. So isn't, is this the same science that supports why some people try and make the claim of using it as a recovery supplement? Because if you take this and it, it dramatically improves sleep, we know how much sleep plays a role yeah. on your guys on your on muscle recovery right so if you do a good job of taking this is it really the is the, it directly affecting exactly is it directly affecting or is it the benefits that they're they're reading or they're, what they're finding out is really because your sleep is dramatically improved which we know what that does for recovery that is such a good question because that would be of, what i would speculate of course if you're getting bad sleep versus good sleep your recovery is going to be dramatically different mm -hmm. absolutely of course that's a very very interesting question well i mean the, uh, of the people that uh, use Ned's uh, Hemp Oil, which is the company that we're, that we're sponsored by, it provides a CBD product, but it's got other cannabinoids besides the THC, right? So the feedback that we get, the number one reason people use it and keep using it is for uh, sleep issues. That's yeah. number one. Number two is anxiety. Now, th there is a lot of speculation that the reason why it helps with sleep is because it helps with anxiety. Not necessarily that it makes you sleepy or tired. Right. And that's my experience. If I take it, I don't get tired, but no. I do get calm. Yeah. Which, I, you know, is totally different. Yeah. I feel the same way. First question is from Blaze84. When returning to a one to five rep phase from eight to 12 and or 15 to 20 reps, do you continue using the same weight from your last five rep max? Add or remove a few pound, pounds or start back at my five rep max and see how I feel and go from there. That's a hard one yeah. to answer because yeah. there's going to be a, a lot of variance. Well, I'll tell you what I do. Um, so let's say I trained for three weeks in a low rep range, right? One to five. And then I next few weeks, I go eight to 12. And then the next few weeks, I go 15 to 20. And now it's time to go back to my one to five rep range. I start my workouts with what I finished with and my last time I was in that mm. phase to feel it out. Now, usually what happens, and now I've been doing this for so long that that doesn't always happen because at this point to get my body to continue to progress, now I'm kind of hitting, I feel like I'm hitting certain genetic limits or whatever. But I, I typically feel, uh, you know, because I keep a log, right? And I'll do what I did the previous time I did the low rep range and I'll find that I could squeeze out and another rep, oh, okay, or I so, add a little bit of weight. So let me get that, get this straight. Now you start back where you started before on that one to five, not where you finished. No, where I where I finished the one to five phase in. 
Wow. The last time I left it at. So exactly, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. let's say you just went through a phase, and let's just use deadlift to make sure, it easy. Where you peaked. Sure. So yeah, you 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 start back where you peaked. I'll st I'll start back to where I feel like uh, I got to, and if I was comfortable there. That's uh, usually where I'll go. So let's say I, I I finished my first one to five rep range, and I was able to get you know five reps with 450 or something like that. I'll grab 450. Now, if it was a single, I won't do that. So I'm glad that's 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 good. I should I should clarify. If it was one rep, I'm not going to go back to my last one rep max because if it mm. is heavy or too heavy, I, there's nowhere for me to go. Well, yeah, I I'll pick like the four or five rep. Yeah, so I typically go back to the exact same weight that I started the that phase before. But what I notice is that like it's easier. Let's sure. like you know, let's just say for again using the deadlift as an example. I just let's say we're running at that's probably better advice for most people. Maps anabolic, yeah. and you know I, I start off when I'm working, you know reps of five. You know I start off in week one, and I'm and I'm doing let's just say for argument's sake, you know three seventy five or something. Uh, you know, and then I go through the whole fa strength phase, and maybe I, towards the end, I'm I'm now pulling in the mid fours or something. And then I move into the next phase. Well, then I come back around. I still start back at 375 uh, just for safe reasons and to see where I'm at. Plus, like you're, to your point, you know, it's rare that I get – I'm making huge leaps, strength leaps. So I can normally just tell right away what the 375 feels like in comparison to last time. And yeah. if I've done a good job of following – Then you jump up substantially, yeah, right? Exactly. If you the, see the that jump, it's easier. Yeah, the jumps yeah, are bigger. That's what I do. Right, so the jumps are bigger. So now where it took me – you know, all the way through the phase to get from 375 to maybe 450 or something. Maybe I'm at 450 within weeks two or three right mm -hmm. away. So yeah. it's just uh, typically that's kind of how I do it. But yeah, that's why it's hard though, because it, it depends it, on who you got. It's you, such a fuel thing for me too with that. Well, yeah, so. think of how you have a new, like a new client can get these types of gains, right? Like if it's a first time someone's ran, like they've never ran like a really good program where they've structured it and they they purchase anabolic, they're running through it. And they run through one time and they come back a second time. A lot of times that person coming to this can do exactly what you said, Sal. They can start at their what they peaked at mm -hmm. because their body is responding so well to this to actually programming legitimately that they when they come back around the second time. So it yeah, really depends so, on where so you're at. So let me let me clarify mm -hmm. because that's a great point that you bring up. Um I, w I think if you're doing it this way, what you need to do if you pick the weight that you used last time in that rep range. Pick the weight that you used at the upper part of the rep range because if it's what you did five reps with and the range is one to five and then you try it again and you're like, oh, I'm not any stronger or maybe you regressed, which is unlikely, mm -hmm. at least you could drop reps. You don't want to go with the one rep max because yeah, right. now you're screwed. Where do you go from there? But more often than not, this is what happens. Now, unless your diet is off and all that stuff. Yeah. If, you're, if you're nowhere near your – because you got to keep in mind everybody has a potential – you have a genetic potential, and at the bottom of that potential is you being totally inactive, you know, sitting on the couch all day, eating terribly, not taking care of your body. At the top of that potential is what you can achieve when you've got a great workout. It's programmed appropriately for your body. You've got a great diet, good sleep, good lifestyle, all that stuff. So there's your potential, and then, of course, how long you've been training and whether or not you're hitting that upper limit. So if you're, if you're not at your total potential, if you haven't reached your genetic potential yet, Following a program like that, you're going to find that you're going to be stronger when you revisit those old phases. It's just you can actually almost expect it. Uh, but, of course, consider lots of different factors. I wouldn't expect it if the first time you did it, your diet was on point, you were sleeping good, and the second time around, everything else was off. But the progress you should see is should be pretty damn consistent. And people have told me that they enjoyed the second and third round of a MAPS program more than the first round because then they've gone through it. They can modify it a little bit. They know how their body's responding. And the second time around, their body responds uh, even better. Next question is from Shell Keep Fit. Bodybuilders have to do some intense poses that often involve contorting their body in different positions. What specific mobility movements would be beneficial for a bodybuilding competitor? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I thought is. that was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, so uh, I like um, – God, what a good question. I, I've never actually even really thought about this from this perspective, uh, but I know how much I have to like twist and rotate. Um, like when you're up and you're doing like let's say a double bicep or if you're a men's physique and you're doing the, the your, your front pose – you actually are you're facing one direction and you're rotating your upper body to kind of like, you know, twist your obliques and your abs so that gets all tightened up. 
So I would think a, a, some good rotational strength stuff would be incredible for, totally. uh, for a, a bodybuilder for that reason. Yeah, if you okay, so let's look at the compulsory uh, bodybuilding uh, poses. And then these are the ones that you go on stage and you're required to do. And then, of course, when you do your, your, your normal routine where you can get creative and do all kinds of different poses. But the compulsory ones are front double bicep, back double bicep, front lat spread, rear lat spread, front... Uh, thigh shot and ab shot. And I think that's all of it. Most muscular, I'm not sure if that's compulsory, but it might be, right? So there's your poses. When you see when you when you see bodybuilders pose on stage where they typically have issues is their back double bicep, rear lat spread. So that's typically those are hard because a, a, a rear double bicep requires good enough shoulder mobility and scapular mobility to where you could both squeeze the back and spread the scapula. That's not a necessarily e easy thing to do. People either squeeze too much and give themselves mm. the appearance of looking flat, or they round too much and now they don't bring out the muscularity of the middle of the back. So you'd want so the wall test mm -hmm. uh, in Maps Prime would be great for that kind of control, and then some scapular mobility movements like uh, like wall circles or something like that. I think yeah. could help for that. I picked this question uh, because of working with various models and different people coming through on our programs and everything. In the bodybuilding uh, side of it, it was I noticed a lot of immobility in the shoulders specifically. So that's to to that point, Sal. I I definitely would would you know would would emphasize that in going you know, to, to present yourself in a certain way on stage to really open that up and, and to be able to, uh, like, I, I was just imagining that, like not even having the ability to retract and depress, like, like you should, yeah. uh, would affect the way that you're going to present your muscles on stage. Yeah. Yes. What, what a really what interesting question. I really haven't thought, and you're right, Justin, like we, I mean, we had, uh, some, a bodybuilder friend of mine that did actually the, he did the posing or did all the exercises in anabolic and, uh, I don't think we were prepared to see his lack of mobility and how how little range of motion he had in his shoulders, and that is so. I think of that's a result of how he trains, right? No, one yeah. hundred percent. So I, I I definitely agree with the wall test circles. Um, I and thread the needle. So when I was talking about like totally. thoracic, yeah. uh, oh, rotation, thoracic rotation, be huge. yeah, yeah. So especially for like the men's physique guys, I are, have one even better for that. Hmm. So when so and these aren't compulsory poses, but bodybuilders and physique athletes, especially bodybuilders, like to do these twisting. Back, you know, a rear double bicep, front double bicep shots, or and the reason why you like to do it is because it makes your waist look smaller, makes your shoulders look wider. And by the way, as a bodybuilder, how you present your physique can make or break uh, your your odds of winning. I mean, there's there's in the '90s, I remember there was a bodybuilder, Paul Dillett, who standing there relaxed looked like he would win. He just looked like a monster. When he started posing, he lost every time because he didn't know how to present uh, his body properly. And one of the most difficult thing to do are these twisting shots. And so it's that rotation and be able to have that good shoulder mobility. I would say uh, uh, windmill. Mm. You get really good at windmill. Um, you're able to create that straight line with your upper body with the rotation and the lumbar and the activation of the uh, of the thoracic. Mm -hmm. I think be really good. Now, for those of you who aren't bodybuilders, I'm going to give you some interesting uh, tips that I think you'll benefit from. Forget whether or not you're posing in front on a stage or not. I think the bodybuilding poses have their own value. I think if you can practice holding these poses and squeezing them to where pretend like you're being watched on stage. So you're doing a front double bicep. It's not just your biceps that are being looked at. It's your chest. It's your abs. It's your thighs, your calves. It's the whole package. Hold these poses and try to maintain composure they become great static tension exercises mm -hmm. just in and of themselves. So for the average person listening, if you're especially if you're working out at home and you're looking for ways to increase the intensity of your workouts or just add something, at the end of your workout, uh, go through the compulsory bodybuilding poses for about 10 minutes. Spend hold them for 10, 15, 20 seconds like you're being watched by a judge and yeah. watch how you feel. It's pretty funny because the first time going through FRC, you know, like, a, and, and, you know, realizing that you can intensify that muscle squeeze and like, that's the whole point of these types of stretches. Like I was thinking about bodybuilding poses. I'm like, this is, they're just like set up in, in different, you know, different angles and your body's in different positions, but it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, if you utilize isometrics, it will really open things up for you. Next question is from Coop Lowcamp. Is it detrimental to squat with your feet slightly angled outward? Um, depends on the person. Um, I think if your feet have to point out, 
uh, be, and you have to take a stance due to your poor mobility, then the detriment can, can come from the fact that it may increase risk of injury. It may reduce the effectiveness of the exercise because your range of motion isn't uh, yeah. great. Uh, but the real issue becomes the fact that you end up strengthening movement through poor mobility because what you train gets stronger. So back to like the previous question, we talked about bodybuilders with poor mobility, especially in the shoulders. This, if you watch bodybuilders, you know what they're trying to do oftentimes is feel a muscle. They're trying to maintain tension, and one of the the, the bad ways of doing this, uh, it's effective in keeping tension, but it's a bad way because you do it too long, you end up creating problems. Is to cut your reps short. So like if I do a shoulder press and stop just short a lockout and come back down, I'll keep tension. Uh, on my shoulders, but what ends up happening is I end up strengthening a short, bad range of motion, and it makes anything else uh, really weak. The better way to maintain tension in a muscle is to know how to keep tension in it through a full range of motion. So with this question here, if it's a mobility issue, work on that because yeah. then it's detrimental. Otherwise, if it's a structural issue, I think it's okay. Yeah, I think uh, I was just interested in this question just because of um, what I've heard from strength coaches and from uh, you know, coming up through like squatting techniques, like a lot of times, like they blame it on genetics or they blame it on the way that your gait is or, you know, the, the alignment. Uh, and, and so then like the outward uh, stance with your feet is, you know, then suggested. And then that's the end of the conversation. And it's not something that needs to be addressed in terms of, well, if you can't squat with your feet pointed straight, like why not? Mm -hmm. Why can't you still produce, you know, the kind of stability around your joints to be able to still, uh, you know, go through a movement like that that's fundamental? So uh, for my own uh, personal opinion, like, I think you should be able to squat with your feet in multiple directions. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm with you on that, Justin, and that's changed for me. So I did fall in the camp of, because like you just alluded to, is I, I read, I followed a lot of these strength coaches that would 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 say that would say that you know everybody is you know anatomically different and you know some of us have hips that are positioned this way some of us have hips that are that way therefore when you squat you know some people might have a more externally rotated so feet feet open type of stance some a little bit more narrow and you should do whatever your morphology allows you to do and then squat like that and so I fell in this category of having like this really kind of wide stance when I squatted and my feet were opened up because, but the truth was that's because I, I lacked the ankle and hip mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now I'm in a, so I went and I'll, I'll put a picture up. If I get, if you guys remind me today, I'll do this uh, for when this episode goes up is I, I, I have a picture of uh, when I was squatting during bodybuilding. So I've got three plates on my back and I remember having I remember having Katrina take a picture of me because I was actually proud of my squat and where it was at currently at that time. And when you look at my squat today versus just that three, four years ago, it's dramatically different. And the big difference between that squat and my squat today is that that's when I remember Brink was the one that kind of like destroyed that theory for me. He says, like, absolutely, you should be able to do that. And if you can't, it's not an anatomical thing that's limiting you from doing that. It's the fact that you haven't trained the the mobility in your ankles and your hips. If you actually put the work in at them, over time, you should be able to get that way. Now, he wasn't recommending that I go from somebody who was super wide stance, feet all open, to the next day, narrow stance, feet straight ahead from no, me. It's because, a gradual process. Yeah, it's a yeah. gradual process. I got to work on the ankle and the hip mobility to get there. And that's what kind of started that journey. And now you can, and I'm, and I had all the, the good excuses of why my, you know, morphology would not allow me to do it. I'm a six foot three guy, I have right. really long femurs. I have all the things that say, you know, okay, t based off of your breakdown, you should squat kind of like this. And I've completely shattered that paradigm now. I mean, I can get into a, a stance where my heels are damn near touching each other. I can take a straightforward feet less than six inches apart from each other and squat ass to grass. But that was three years of like working hard at my my ankle and my hip mobility, but now I can do it. And because of that, I can do that now. When I squat and I load a lot, I don't get the the low back pain, the the bursitis in my hips and all the issues that I used to. So you've also opened up the full potential of the squat now. Right. Because yeah. you have all these different angles you can use and it's far more comfortable. Oh yeah. I, I I'm squatting less frequently. 
and I don't have to get as much weight to don't have to squat as much weight to see the same kind of development in my legs that I used to. So it's completely benefited me by putting the time and effort in the mobility. So my answer to this is if you squat that way right now, it's not that it's wrong or it's bad, but it's kind of like how we talked about people who don't squat whatsoever. And because it's hard on their back or it's hard for whatever reason, you should be working towards getting to a place where you can squat with your feet completely straight. That doesn't mean that you just, just go that way from, you know, overnight. Cause you hear that it's, Hey, if you had better ankle mobility, you had better foot control and you had better hip mobility, you probably would be able to squat with your feet very well, straight. And I think, you know, up the kinetic chain, how that affects everything, uh, you know, being ex externally rotated and over time, you, you know, like your knee is going to track in a certain way because of that fact of like always reinforcing that, that specific angle. So I just think to consider that to try and, you know, change the foot position would allow more longevity and things. Like now, that. now I'm going to be very careful with what I'm about to say, because I don't want this to be used as an excuse for poor mobility, because more often than not, the vast majority of the time somebody has issues with this, it's lack of control, stability, and mobility. But sometimes there are, uh, you know, uh, structural morphologies. There are structural hip joints that do not allow for squats to look a particular way. Now, it's not the, the main reason why. It's not the common reason. But you can look at x-rays. You can look at bone structures. And you can see that hips yeah. all necessarily look the same. And there are some types of hips where the bone just that they just don't move that way, where slightly turning the feet out or having a different stance is best for that person. But you'll never know unless you work on your mobility. You'll never know what that if that's right. you. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Amelia Jude R D. <clears throat> a friend and I have been discussing the topic of physical relations versus porn. Is there Ooh. a difference between masturbation to porn and having actual physical relations? with someone that you care oh, about. Shit, you picked this question? Yeah. Well, so you the, wanted to go here. Huh? Uh, you know why? Wow. Because <laughs> this is actually uh becoming a big mm. uh it's this is a big conversation for society. So yeah. this the okay, the question is there a difference between, you know, masturbating to porn and having actual physical relations with someone you care about? Yeah, obviously. It's totally different, right? Yeah. I mean, you're you're still having sex, you're still I mean, you're still orgasming, but you're yeah, it gets old after one while. you're doing on your own and you're being stimulated by something visually. The other one you are with someone else and doing it. So I think there's a big difference uh, between the two for sure. Now, as far as porn itself, you know, we've now had it easily accessible to us long enough that we can actually look at data because for a long, you know, the, for porn's been around for a long time, right? There's been, you know, it's got as soon as we could draw paintings and pictures, yeah. we've been making pornography magazines when I was a kid and VHS John videos. And, and then it was D DVDs and, you know, now it's the internet. So porn's been around for a long time and the Puritans, if you will, have always said it's bad. Um, and other people have said, oh, it's not that big of a deal. But the, the data before didn't necessarily, except for instances where people had addictions, didn't necessarily support that it was bad, but now we're in a completely different situation where the access of it, there's no barriers uh, like there used to be. So when, like, I'll give you an example. When I was growing up, if I wanted a dirty magazine or a, a VHS you know, porn video, hmm. the barrier was going to a place that sold it, looking the dude in the face. You got to go through the beads. Yes. And you got to walk all the way in the back That's with right. all the weird, like uncomfortable <laughs> yes. imagery. Yeah. The, the V8, so these these video rental stores, there would be like a room with beads. Always, right? What was that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You got to go through beads and, so they know. And you, it says yeah. adults only, right? And you yeah. walk through and then there's the, you know, there's the, the dirty movies or whatever. And if you wanted to buy a magazine, you had to go to a convenience store. Yeah. You had to stand in line. never had the balls to do it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. There was a lot of barriers. Plus, if you bought one magazine, and you, you didn't have a million pictures or whatever you know, accessible to you right then and there. So we do have data now to show what the ease of accessibility and the, the novelty, because now porn is extremely novel. I can literally look up a specific category, and I can find an infinite number of pictures and videos that are in a specific category. You can never do that before. What is the data showing? Well, the data is showing that young men are now reporting erectile dysfunction issues when they never did before. It was extremely rare for a 20-year-old man 
to go to a erectile dysfunction doctor and say, and then test them and say, oh, your testosterone levels are normal. Everything's normal, but I can't get an erection now when I have sex with my girlfriend or my wife. That never, never happened before. So that's a big one. The second one uh, that the data shows is that uh, what is considered um, normal is changing completely because we're now being exposed to a wide variety Mm -hmm. of different things that people are getting into more and more extreme forms of of sex. Now, is that that a good or a bad thing? It's okay for now, but I could could see how if it's pushed too far, it might be necessarily a bad thing. Um, Pornography in the past was one of the, the, you know, it was one of the reasons why people would get divorced, but it wasn't a top reason. You know, the top reasons were like kids and money and fidelity. Porn is now becoming one of the number one reasons why couples actually get divorced. So it's actually something that can become a problem uh, today where, necess- where it wasn't necessarily a problem before. I find this, this question uh, really uncomfortable to answer. And I don't know if it's because <laughs> of my mustache right now. <laughs> It's uncomfortable for me <laughs> watching you talk about it. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I think of this because here, right? There's a there's obviously a uh, religious and spiritual side on, and, and view that uh, point that they have on this, right? That it's it's bad, right? There's there's sure. objectifying bodies is bad. That's the view of you're right, yeah, right? Spirituality, and, and, and if and if you're thinking of doing the thing, it's as bad as the act of actually sure. doing the thing. So that's so from a from a religious spiritual side, I understand where where that's coming from. So that you got you're for sure going to have listeners that are listening right now that are going to side with that. And I don't necessarily disagree with that as much, although I do think that it it, ha- it does have values in places. Um, and, I, and I've seen this firsthand with, I mean, I've, uh, being a personal trainer for, for 20 years, you, you get the opportunity to talk to a lot of people and, and you build relationships with clients that, that tend to open up and share some things with you. And, you know, in my experience, I have seen some some positive things from the use of that. For example, um, I've had clients that are both uh, type A personality, high performing uh, people in work, uh, executives, and their sex life just take a shit. And a lot of that, and and I think now that I'm older, been in business for a long time, I can see uh, this how I've seen uh, fractions of this in my own life where. I can become so consumed with work and uh, being distracted that even when I'm with my beautiful partner, I have a hard time being stimulated. And so I've seen couples use something like pornography to get out of their heads of their business mind and thinking and be focused on that to get watched together. And then all of a sudden it spurs this great sexual experience for them. So if that helps your relationship because you're not having a a connection with your partner, I can see that as a, as a a great tool there. I have also seen it in relationships where uh, one spouse is for whatever reasons, health reasons, surgeries, uh, something going on with them, maybe pregnant. And so they they've lost their sex drive, but yet their partner hasn't lost their sex drive. And it's like, you know, you could you potentially be that person who's tempted to go out and cheat, and instead of doing that, you utilize pornography to, you know, uh, fulfill that desire that you have, and that helps you. So I, I've seen it mm-hmm. used as a as a positive tool in people's relationships, and it's helped them. Then you have the other side, which you brought up, mm-hmm. Sal, which is the abuse of it, and that, I think of like how we talk about, you know fast food or yes. you know it's similar like it can this can easily be abused right it's it's something that is it can be highly addictive uh and can go from it being a tool to something that is being abused and i think that it is very easily abused especially when it gets in the hands of younger yeah. younger teen and boys and then it well. distorts your view of reality which is also kind of a problem it, it, you know like seeing certain imagery and like looking at uh, women a certain way like you're just walking around like it kind of reinforces this this kind of different idea of of <laughs> you know scenarios that are going to happen like the pizza guy is not you know getting action let's be honest yeah, no 100% and i think you bring up some very interesting points adam i think think if you're you know on a voyage with your partner to become intimate with each other through confiding in each other fantasy I mean that's a big deal right when you have a partner that you feel honest uh, that you feel you could be open with that you could tell what you fantasize about or what and, and you feel comfortable enough to do that that brings people close together that's intimacy and I could see pornography being used as a tool for that. 
if it starts to distract you or numb you, which the numbing uh, process from pornography is the reason why you're seeing men reporting erectile dysfunction because mm -hmm. the way, just like you said with processed food, if I expose my brain and my my receptors to hyper sweet, hyper palatable food all the time, what ends up happening, your body adapts. Your body adapts and it starts to find things that are less stimulating, much more bland than they were before. So if you eat lots of candy all the time and you're just overstimulated with hyper sweetness and, and hyper palatability, and then you go eat some fruit, the fruit tastes really bland. And I've experienced this. This is you go on a go on a diet where you cut sugar out, mm -hmm. watch how tasty a pe go keto for a month, go eat a piece of fruit afterwards, and it's gonna be like the sweetest piece of candy of all time. Yeah. This happens with uh, pornography. We know this. In fact, if listen, if you're listening and you look at pornography a lot, you know what I'm talking about. You go on pornography daily, you'll find that the kind of pornography you need to stimulate you becomes more and more novel, more and more extreme, and it starts to lose its power. It's very much like a drug. Totally. I mean, I totally look at it just like a drug, and uh, you know, you, it can become a, an obsession really fast. Uh, it can initially start as something that just has helped you sort of distract yourself from, uh, you, you know, your own desires and passions that you're not getting fulfilled, whatever it is. But, you know, like sooner or later, you know, the more you lean on that, the, the less passionate you become towards, you know, the real thing. And that's the problem. Dude, I talked to um, Bishop Barron on this particular topic. And, you know, we, we talked about you touched on the spiritual religious side. And I said, you know, it says uh, in, in Christianity that, you know, having sex without the intent of procreation or even blocking the potential for procreation is not a good thing. That's what I said to him. So like if you even have sex with a condom, birth control, let alone masturbation and porn aren't necessarily good. And he said, look, this is what he told me. He says, there's a lot of things you could do that are sins. And he says the sexual ones, uh, you know, the ones that are more common aren't as bad, he says, as the as some of the other stuff. He says, but you know, the Christianity, what it says is that the purest form, the perfect form of sex, is it it results in the possibility of procreation. I can't disagree with that. I, I would agree that that would be the most pure form. You're connected with someone so much so that producing a, a you know a child is is part of the whole process. I get that, and I get that everything else might not be as perfect. That's what they refer to when they say it's not ideal. But what I, the reason why I want to communicate that is I think what will happen if – and I know this. I experienced this. I grew up in a Catholic family. If you're constantly told it's bad, 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 don't do – because right now what will end up happening, we're saying porn can do this and that. Someone's going to watch porn after the episode because they're told don't do it. Just yeah. like if you have this relationship with food where you're like process food, bad, avoid, avoid, avoid. Then you restrict and binge, restrict and binge. Rather than having a healthy relationship with processed food, which allows you to, if you want some, you have a little bit. If you don't, you don't. And it's not this huge type of stress. So I did want to kind of bring that up a little bit to give people that that, that uh, perspective. Yeah, I also want to make it clear that like this is not in my expertise whatsoever. Like yeah. So me talking- You're talking to, to three dudes that- Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, I'm just sharing what- Look what at porn I, sometimes. What I, what I have learned from- I mean, I'm an expert at porn. My, well, I didn't really have it growing up, right? It's it just, I mean, I had, like you said, like a magazine, and then I remember at a teenage boy, I finally got my first video cassette. Um, I didn't really have it. I didn't use, when Pornhub became a thing, like I didn't really use it. I really didn't. It was not a, I've never been like a- big pornography guy. And I don't know if that's because I've I've had a, a healthier sexual relation relationships growing up uh, from my teenage years into young adulthood or what. So I have a I I feel like I have a pretty good handle of that in my relationship today. Like uh, Katrina and I, I don't know, maybe in a month's time, maybe use it once or twice, mm -hmm. you know, maybe in a month's time. Like maybe it was a crazy month, we use it a few times, but then we could go months and not use it whatsoever. So and that's me also personally. I just it's not something that I feel but I do know a lot of people that it takes hold of their life and it becomes something that they use all the time. And then I also know relationships that struggle a lot because uh, one person in the relationship gets jealous of it. Yeah, you know, and that and that's a very unhealthy place to be. And that's another conversation in itself. Is you know a partner that uh, is going to get insecure about you masturbating to a a porn hub or something like that. So that that you have to you have to weigh that in too of what what's going on with your own relationship. It really is a highlight, and we've gotten closer and closer to this point where you know because 
societies have become more advanced. We have a lot of free societies. We have what are called, you know, we have free markets, which free markets are excellent at giving us what we want. But that doesn't mean that what we want isn't always, you know, good or bad. And so what we're creating is a society that gives us everything that we could ever want. So that puts a lot of responsibility now on us, right? So now, mm -hmm. now I have food everywhere. You have to do your own restricting. Yeah. So I mean, I could. Most people are dying from too much food rather than too little food. So that places a whole new responsibility. We're now at the point with pornography where if I wanted to, I could consume an infinite supply of it. So now the responsibility is on me. There's no you know, barriers there. Who knows what it's going to look like when you can have a sex robot that looks and feels like a human? Is that going to cause new potential problems? So I really do. Th I like this conversation because I, I don't think it's that different from what we talk about all the time when it comes to nutrition and exercise and stuff like that. It's really about... You know, not letting things control you, uh, but rather doing the reverse, controlling it. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com, download all of our guides, resources, and books. They're totally free. You can also find your three favorite podcast hosts in the world uh, on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam. And, and by the way, Doug has an Instagram page too. He actually shows the ins and outs of behind the scenes here at Mind Pump on his page. He's found at Mind Pump Doug.